The Florida presidential preference primary riding the roller coaster of election 2020. The drama shifted from deciding on which candidate would win among many on the Democratic side to arguments about whether voting would continue under the threat of coronavirus. We're following both topics this morning and we're exploring the use of social media by candidates, what has worked and what hasn't this cycle in the next 30 minutes on This Week in Jacksonville. So glad that you're joining us today. We cover politics and hot topics on this program. Politics aplenty in our next two segments. The hot topic everywhere in the world is coronavirus. And so joining us via Skype right now is Dr. Joseph Servin from Mayo Clinic. Dr. Servin, uh, welcome to our area. And I know you've got a long resume in neurology, but I know you've been studying up on coronavirus as well. I I'm hoping you can help all of us watching today and take us from anxiety, the being anxious, to being informed about this. This is a pretty important component right now, isn't it? Absolutely. So here are the facts about it. We have this very specific virus. It's a member of the coronavirus, which is a family of viruses that includes very instant viruses, such as the common cold, to much more serious viruses, such as SARS and We know that this particular virus is spread through respiratory droplets, that's when you cough or sneeze. And the virus can live on surfaces even after the infected person has moved on from there. It's very contagious. The vast majority of people have mild symptoms, but the older you are, or if you have chronic conditions such as diabetes or high blood pressure, they are the ones more likely to have more severe illness based on what we have seen occurring in China and now in Japan. Yeah, I know we're using some uh, 21st century technology. Lean in a little bit closer is what our producers are saying so I can hear you a little better. But as you talk about COVID-19 and, and that it's uh, in this family, it's a coronavirus, I guess what's your advice for good health for people, uh, given that life has changed radically just in the last two weeks? Yeah. The, uh, because we don't have any or treatment at this moment, everyone's working on it, we have to prevent a situation where everyone gets sick at the same time because we don't have natural immunity to the virus. So the only answer is prevention. So the common sense thing, wash your hands, um, cover yourself if you sneeze or cough, uh, self-isolate uh, if you feel sick, you have to that it's this virus as opposed to something else. Uh, make sure you wash your hands at every occasion you can. I can't say that enough. And wipe down any surfaces that if you sneeze or cough, touch so that you don't touch your face and get infected because that's how it causes the condition that gets into your body through these respiratory droplets that you come in by touching your face, eyes, or nose. Well, I, and I can appreciate what you just said about uh, if you've got some of the symptoms, you've got to assume that you, you've got this virus just uh, out of safety sake. So one of the questions that we got this week uh, is if someone is trying to self-quarantine, but they've got children or they've got a spouse, how do you keep the rest of the family safe if you're the one with the symptoms? Yeah, and this is where it gets very tricky. You literally have to physically separate oneself in the house, the apartment, or wherever you live. One room is for the person who is ill, and the other rooms are for the people who are not. And you really have to separate. That means the bathroom, the towels, uh, the dishes that that person is using. You literally have to have two sets of things, one for the sick person and one for the people who are not. And you have to try as best and separate it. The people, the person who is sick has to be covered with a mask or something so that they don't spread that. And the people who are sick should limit any time that they're in that room to try to minimize the chances of, of picking up the infection, knowing that none of us can be perfect in that situation. Yeah, just another question or two for you, Dr. Servin. You know, one week we went from zero COVID-19 cases in Florida to more than 300. So what would you expect to see in the coming week or the coming months? It is going to spread no matter what kind of prevention measures we take, right? Yeah, at the end of the day, we're going to see this get worse in terms of number of cases. But eventually, if we do our best work with regards to 
physical distancing, incredible cleanliness, washing everything down. We can blunt the number of cases that are presenting with the virus, and more importantly, blunt the number of severe versions of cases so it doesn't overwhelm hospital or health systems. But we are always there to help deal with all the other medical issues that are normal at any other time of day or any other moment. Dr. Servant, I've heard a lot of uh, young people say, hey, I'm young and healthy. I don't want to give it to anybody else, but if I get it, I'm not too worried. I don't know if that's a, a good way to approach it at, at all. But here's my question. Will this virus ever go away, or is it now here to stay like the common cold or like the flu? Well, we don't know what the ultimate thing that will occur with this virus. It may become uh, something that fluctuates and becomes part of our daily life you know, like the flu that pops up in the, in the fall or early spring. But we know one thing for certain, this virus is going to be with the next several months. And that's something we're just going to have to get used to, regardless of how disruptive it is. That we don't have a lot of... Yeah. Dr. Joseph Servin from Mayo Clinic, appreciate your time, appreciate uh, efforts to make all of us more aware of what we're dealing with during this coronavirus crisis. Thanks for your time. Yeah, absolutely, a pleasure. All right, so coming up here on This Week in Jackson, we're going to look at the Florida primary results and the impact of coronavirus on the election. Rick Mullaney and John Newman next on This Week in Jackson. The KPT experience is only available at one place. Keith Pearson Toyota. We service all our Toyotas here because the service is great. And the cafe is not bad either. Come to Keith Pearson Toyota. Jacksonville's hometown superstore. Like most people, Mrs. McCabe has several different types of flooring. I have carpet, tile, and hardwood. I've tried running those machines, but they just don't get them as clean as you do. Vacuuming and mopping is great for day-to-day -day cleanings, but nothing gets your home clean and healthy like a professional carpet, tile, or hardwood cleaning from Stanley Steamer. That's why I call. Call or go online for our $99 special. Call 1-800-STEAMER. Stanley Steamer gets your home cleaner. I'll take it. All right. Oh, 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 oh. Hold tight. Hold Meet me tight. right at my desk. Right? The old man's going to show you how to cut a deal. All right. You guys ready to do some paperwork? Yeah. Not until you throw in the carefree scheduled maintenance. Two years of it. Oh, that's standard. Smartphone integration. Yeah, also standard. And she wants all of this for basically just her signature. So basically, sign, then drive? Yeah. Volkswagen's list of standard features goes on and on, but this event won't. Hurry in during the not-so-standard spring event, and you can lease a new 2020 Passat. Zero down, zero deposit, zero first month's payment, and zero to its signing. Practically, just sign, then drive. My father, Bill Harrell, had a vision for Harrell and Harrell. A vision to be passionate, committed, and to serve those who need us. He instilled in us hard work, a respect for service, and to fight for those who have been injured. We are proud and honored to continue his legacy and his mission. Harold and Harold, call us at 251-1111. Don't settle for less than you deserve. Hi, I'm Fat Joe, musician and direct auto insurance spokesperson. How may I help? Hi, I'm Audrey. I need car insurance, but I haven't been able to afford it. Follow me, Audrey. You know I know a thing or two about financial issues. I went from more money to more money problems. Direct order, they're going to work with you regardless of the situation. Nothing can stop me. How you know? I'm all the way up. Get direct and get going. Get a super low down payment for as low as $49. Why do our customers send their families to us? Because we treat everybody like family. That's why we have so much repeat business. I may pull boats all over the country, but I still come back to Keith Pearson Toyota to do all my business. Jacksonville's hometown superstore. For a reason. Prepare. Don't panic. Duval County is ready. Critical coronavirus updates developing minute by minute. Channel 4 said it best. Prepare. Don't panic. News 4 Jax tracking the outbreak as it spreads to local counties. I just got an email from my contact there. Our team of anchors and reporters separates the science from the scare. How Florida's warm weather could affect your chances. The people you know and trust have you covered. To keep you and your family safe. Coronavirus. Prepare. Don't panic. On News 4 Jax.
You're watching This Week in Jacksonville with Kent Justice. The Florida presidential primary election was this past week, and following Super Tuesday at the beginning of the month, Florida voters had their chance to wrap up the competition among Democrats. Here are what the results look like. Joe Biden dispatched Bernie Sanders in a landslide. Biden with more than a million votes and 62% of all the ballots. Sanders with just fewer than 400,000 votes and 23%. Biden is well positioned to be the nominee for Democrats. Republicans also voted in the primary and this was never in doubt. Look at these numbers. President Donald Trump received 1.1 million votes. That's 94% of the Republicans voting. It shapes up as a challenge by the former vice president against the incumbent president when we get to the general election. Now, Rick Mullaney is always a valuable resource for coverage of politics for us. And following our coverage of the Florida primary, Rick spoke with Reverend John Allen Newman. Pastor Newman was a key contributor for our coverage and it was a political advisor to members of both major parties throughout the years. Rick started by asking John Newman what stood out from Florida's primary. Uh, I think a couple of things stand out. Uh, first of all, the, the power of the African-American vote, the Latino vote, or the Hispanic vote in South Florida, which certainly was decisive in this particular uh, primary. Um, as we mentioned off camera, he hurt himself terribly, and it was absolutely an unforced error to talk about Castro. You're talking about, about Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders, yes. Uh, thank you. And to talk about um, Venezuela, Nicaragua, and trying to find some light and all that darkness uh, was really, I think, unfortunate for him, and it hurt him deeply. This outcome with Joe Biden, was this the result you expected? Uh, it, yes and no. I mean, I expected Biden to win. I did not expect Biden to win by this much. This is a, as President Obama once used the term, a shellacking. <laughs> Absolutely. What, what is the significance of this outcome for the future as we begin to look to November? It certainly does appear that with this delegate lead, Joe Biden, it's going to be very tough for Bernie Sanders uh, to overcome. What does this Florida win mean as you look into your crystal ball for November? I think it's very significant because this is actually a purple state. Uh, I once had a conversation with uh, David Seamus, who did a lot of work uh, during President Obama's administration. And he was talking about the trend lines for Florida actually going to kind of a light blue from purple. And so I think this turnout tonight really indicates that that trend is accurate. And so I see all of these um, diverse groups coming together in November. And actually, the thing we have to keep in mind, Rick, more than anything else, is that there is a tremendous unifying factor in November, and that is the Democratic Party wants to definitively change who is the resident is at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Wow. And so that brings everybody together. Well, one of the things you mentioned earlier, diverse demographics was the African-American vote, and we saw in South Carolina how significant that was. Can you comment on the African-American vote both in Florida and what do you think it means come November? I think it's critical. You know, um, a lot of times people look at how the state is broken up for Northeast Florida, Northwest Florida, and then going down the Iflo Corridor, um, and then going down to South Florida. People don't realize, particularly in Jacksonville, Northeast Florida, Northeast Florida in the African-American vote offsets in many ways Western Florida. And then it's a fight between I-4 and South Florida, in which if the numbers come out, Democrats win. So the African-American vote is not just an important vote, it is the actual margin of victory for the Democratic Party in the state. John, you've been an advisor for more than three decades uh, in national and local politics. You look with Obama, who the African-American vote was decisive, and for Hillary Clinton, her, her Hillary Clinton did not turn out the same numbers. What do you see in your crystal ball for Joe Biden, and is that what can make the difference in this race? I think so. I think the African-American community, which is not monolithic by any stretch, but I think by and large, the African-American community sees a continuation of Barack Obama's legacy in Joe Biden. And because there, there is the perception, and in reality to it actually, that President Trump has attempted to almost dismantle everything that was a part of President Obama's legacy, that they want to reestablish it. And so Joe Biden represents the reestablishment of the legacy. Remember, many of the folk never foresaw an African American being president of the United States. So to try to come behind him and wipe out his legacy is really an affront to the African American community. We will be out in tremendous numbers in November. John, I want to shift a little bit because of the virus, which is, of course, the dominant issue and sure. concern in the nation, and its relationship to what we just saw in Florida and to the race. What do you think was the impact of the virus and what we saw in Florida, and potentially what's the impact as we look to November? Well, I think there was absolutely a significant drop-off after 
the virus was taken more seriously. At first, conflicting information, misinformation, even in some instances, dis disinformation. People not really taking the virus seriously. And so, unfortunately, once that happened, there was a tremendous drop off. And with the curtailing of the aggregate numbers of people, the meeting from what, 500 to 250, from 250 to 50, from 50 to 10, of course, you know, that was going to have an impact on the, the election. So I'm not surprised that the turnout was as low as it was. I don't expect that in November, however. And the coronavirus, of course, is something we're going to eventually innovate our way out of. You know, people need to realize that that's often what happens when there, there are times of national crisis. We innovate our way, and we're going to do it again. But we have to be patient. It's going to take time. I mean, there are some places in the country where they have some promising uh, possibilities of cures, in Australia, for instance. But now you got to go through clinical trials and so forth and so on. But we will absolutely innovate our way out of this. But the body politic doesn't need to react in terms of being panicked. They need to think their way through, inform their way through, and then, of course, make the right selection as they feel is a part of their responsibility as citizens in this country in November. John, before we get there, I'd like to bring it down to the local level in our final minutes together. What do you see here locally? And what challenges as a pastor do you face in dealing with this virus and, and, and what you're trying to do at the church? Well, Rick, as I said a, a, a moment ago, it's really been tough when, you know, the CDC comes out and makes, you know, their, their rulings. I wouldn't call them rulings as much as I'd call them guidelines. So they come out with guidelines as to what they think that we should do in terms of how many people should be together. And then when it goes down to 10, it's really a challenge. Can you have church services? What, what are you doing? We're going to, uh, to go online. You know, um, you have streaming at church. Yes, we have to do that because at the end of the day, we've got to protect our, our citizens. And in my congregation, a significant number of people are elderly. So we can't risk them coming out and getting sick. And imagine the reputational damage to any ministry where someone comes to worship, gets sick and or dies, and can trace it back to when they attended worship. It's just not worth the risk. So John, finally, I take it at the personal level, at the church level, at the state level, at the national level, we're all in this together? That's one thing this virus has shown us, that we are all in this together. And that irrespective of your social status, irrespective of how you know, much influence you think you have, or what neighborhood you live in, we're all in the same boat. And people need to realize that together we can fight this thing, together we can win. And perhaps it's kind of been a clarifier for us. We've been so divided as a country, Rick, with our silos and our political silos that something had to wake us up and realize that, you know what, we have a whole lot more in common than we do um, in, in this division. And what that is, is survival. We all want to live. We all want to, you know, flourish. We want our children and to have a, a future. We don't want this to be something that wipes us out. And if we're not careful, and if we continue going into the divided uh, uh, line of existence, then we will shortchange our future and for our children and our grandchildren. So this virus kind of says, you know what, wake up. We have a whole lot we need to do together as a country and as a people, and we can do it together. We cannot do it divided. And again, appreciate Rick Mullaney and John Newman and that conversation there. All right, stay with us. And when we come back, there's social media, some of the best practices for politicians during this run for the Democratic presidential nomination. Stay with us on this week in Jacksonville. Jacksonville, you voted. Now it's time to check out all the winners of Jack's Best. Head to newsforjacks.com slash Jack's Best to see who you picked as the best in every category. Presented by Visit Jacksonville. Attention RVers, Campers in RV of North Florida slashing prices during the inventory liquidation sale. 2019 Sportsman LE, just $19,995 or $153 a month. Visit one of three North Florida locations or online at CampersIn.com. I'm Alfonso, and there's more to me than HIV. There's my career, my cause, my choir. I'm a work in progress. So much goes into who I am. HIV medicine is one part of it. Prescription Devado is for adults who are starting HIV-1 treatment and who aren't resistant to either of the medicines, dolutegravir or lamivudine. Devado has two medicines in one pill to help you reach and then stay undetectable. So your HIV can be controlled with fewer medicines while taking Devado. You can take Devado any time of day, with food or without. Don't take Devado if you're allergic to any of its ingredients or if you take the phetalide. If you have hepatitis B, it can change during treatment with Devado and become harder to treat. 
Your hepatitis B may get worse or become life-threatening if you stop taking Devato. So do not stop Devato without talking to your doctor. Serious side effects can occur, including allergic reactions, liver problems, and liver failure. Life-threatening side effects include lactic acid buildup and severe liver problems. If you have a rash and other symptoms of an allergic reaction, stop taking Devato and get medical help right away. Tell your doctor if you have kidney or liver problems, including hepatitis B or C. One of the ingredients in Devato may harm your unborn baby. Your doctor may prescribe a different medicine than Devato. Your doctor should do a pregnancy test before starting Devato. Use effective birth control while taking Devato. The most common side effects are headache, diarrhea, nausea, trouble sleeping, and tiredness. So much goes into who I am and hope to be. Ask your doctor if starting HIV treatment with Devato is right for you. OMG, look at the new Nissan of Orange Park. And save big bucks on everything when you come to a grand opening. Get a deal on a new with cruise and used. You save more when you spend in a brand new store. Get up to 11 grand off brand new Nissans and your choice of Nissan Altimas and Nissan Rogues starting at only 16.9. They'll all want to know where I'm going to the grand opening of Nissan of Orange Park. Online at NissanofOrangePark.com. You can fill a jumbo jet four times over with the number of people killed by medical mistakes. Not every year, every week. Failing to run a test, giving the wrong drug, a lab mix-up. I know it can feel unnatural to file suit against your doctor or hospital, but when their mistake takes so much away from you, you have to hire a firm who is dedicated to getting to the truth of what happened. Farah and Farah, call us, talk to us. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville on Channel 4. Again, thanks for being with us. Nadia Policard is a CEO of Social Channel Marketing Group. It's a Jacksonville-based social media agency. Florida's primary, just in the rearview mirror, just this past week. And it pretty much puts, puts a wrap on this race between Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden, from our view. Mm -hmm. uh, Sanders seemed to be winning the social media side of things, but that ultimately that didn't mean more votes for him, right? Exactly right, yes. So social media is not a barometer on who's going to win the nomination. Um, what we're seeing is that uh, Bernie is getting more likes, more engagement. He is on average 14 times a day posting on Facebook, doing Facebook Lives, getting tons of engagement. So that means likes, reactions, comments, etc. But that's no indication of him being, you know, the candidate that we're going to nominate. Um, it, for this election. So uh, does that mean, well, it doesn't really matter how you engage on so or what you do on social media? That's not the message, right? No, that's not the message at all. In fact, with everything going on with the coronavirus, like what can the candidates do? And I think this is a great opportunity for them to continue to engage their audiences. So Biden and Sanders, they can go live, you know, do Facebook live streams. And we know that, you know, 74% of Americans are engaging on Facebook daily. And the, prop the number is probably even higher now that people are home um, with everything going on with the coronavirus. Um, so engage your audience, do some live streams, check in, um, you know, be a resource to them. One of the things that stands out to me, I know, so from our side of, of the street, as a journalist, hey, I want to engage in social media. I want, uh, whether it's on our digital platform uh, and people comment, I want to respond, or if it's on Facebook, uh, what's the most effective thing for our politicians when you're running a campaign? Where should they be spending time? Is it posting pictures on Instagram? Is it something else? I think the candidates need to be everywhere that their audience is naturally consuming content. Um, so they have all the data on their average voter, right? Um, there's a lot of data out there available on, you know, what age groups, what um, racial groups um, are, like which channels they're spending a lot of their time on social media. Um, so we saw earlier this week, Bernie Sanders, for example, was on TikTok with his grandson, and that video went viral. Um, and we know that, the, you know, Bernie has a lot of, like, younger supporters. Um, so they absolutely love that. And then we saw um, on Tuesday, or not Tuesday, I'm sorry, Sunday during the um, Dem Democratic debate, uh, Bernie Sanders made a comment about, you know, telling his, you know, the audience to go to the YouTube um, to see Biden's record on Social Security and go to the YouTube ended up being a trending topic on Twitter that night and into the next morning. Um, but to answer your question, they need to have the data on where their audience is naturally consuming the content, um, use that as their primary focus, but also be everywhere. TikTok is a big thing, Instagram, big thing, Facebook for sure, and then definitely Twitter. 
Well, let, let's look at some of the, the data here. I want to show you uh, Facebook ad spending. And uh, this is from March 2018, I'm sorry, May 2018 through March 4th of 2020. Uh, Joe Biden spent five and a half million dollars. Bernie Sanders, eleven and a half million dollars. Elizabeth Warren, nine plus million dollars. And then there's Mike Bloomberg. Mm -hmm. Is that a typo? No, that's not a typo. No. Sixty three point seven million dollars just on Facebook ad spending. Ultimately, that did not get him even to this next level of being a candidate, right? Exactly. So, again, that just tells us social media, the numbers are not an indication on how the candidates are going to fare well or whether they're going to do well at all. Um, so Bloomberg spent almost $64 million on Facebook ads. So with Facebook's, you know, transparency um, approach, you can see how, many biz how much money businesses and, um, in this case, politicians are spending on Facebook ads. And that number is amazing. Like, it's just $64 million and what happened? Yeah. Um, and then look at Joe Biden. He has the lowest number of Facebook ad spend, and then he's leading far ahead um, Bernie yeah, Sanders. On, on the delegates, yeah. Yeah. So from here until November in this big general election, and certainly things ramp up after the, the national political con conventions, but do you expect to see more investment, more money poured into social media advertising? You know, I do, but there's a lot of rumble that Sanders might be dropping out in the next couple of weeks, right? Um, so what does Joe Biden need to do if he is the one, you know, we can assume he is. Um, what does he need to do? Continue to engage his audience. Um, Facebook Lives, as I mentioned, are like live streaming is a big thing. Um, demonstrate leadership right now, um, especially during these unprecedented times. Um, engage your audience. Let them know that you are the right candidate to um, you know, lead the way, lead the path, and be a leader, and to uh, bring our nation together when so many people are worried about how they're going yeah. to feed their families next week, maybe even next month. Um, you know, we have a lot of students that are home now, and I think it's being reported that 30 million students um, rely on school meals in order to eat. So. Right. Well, it's something we'll be watching. I know you're you're the expert, so I know you're watching this. But yeah. uh, thanks for sharing some of your expertise this morning on social media and those habits for our candidates. Absolutely. Anytime. All right. Nadia, thank you. Well, This Week in Jacksonville airs each Sunday morning at this time. Uh, we will continue following things happening at the state government level. A budget has been passed for the state of Florida. Maybe next week we'll get into what that really means. I'm Kent Justice. Thanks for watching on air on Channel 4 and the CW17 and always online at news4jax.com. More people in Northeast Florida and South Georgia get their news from News 4 Jax than anywhere else.